All right, and we are live. Welcome to the Fox Shot Sierra podcast. This is your host, Franco Sonera, and here we go. To the Fox Trot Sierra podcast. This is your host once again, Franco Sonera. Yeah, I apologize for the uh, delay. Delay. Uh, yeah, I just ran to a little snag and then got hit with a last minute phone call that I really had to take, though. But I'm back right now giving you this sweet, sweet, delicious content. So on your way in, get this video a like so I can level up on the algorithm and so I can party all night long, baby. Woo! <laughs> all right. Uh, announcements first off, uh, Instagram. Uh, follow me on Instagram at, at the Fox Shot Sierra Podcast, where I post uh, various uh, short stories and clips. Um, yeah, what else was gonna say? Oh, that's phone going off. Let it go off. But anyway, um, what was I going to uh, remember? Oh yeah, Instagram. Uh, I post a uh, video on uh, DL and I. Uh, we were talking about uh, the Battle of, Cal- of Calais and how Claude Nicholson held out to pretty much the uh, uh, held to the last bullet and surrendered in three days. But his actions alone helped uh, Dunkirk evacuate troops in the, in the tens of thousands because his actions uh, divert some, some of the Germans uh, towards them so they're not freed up to go and fight in Calais. You know what? Shout out to Claude Nicholson. Rest in peace. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, I have to jump in a little gun there for a sec. <laughs> All right. Uh, YouTube. Uh, search me on YouTube for at the Fox Shots Here podcast where I can actually see this lovely, lovely uh, logo at the bottom screen there. And yeah, just give me a follow. Give me a like. Level up, baby. And last but not least, uh, Reddit. Uh, follow me on Reddit. Um, it's it's like uh, Instagram. Uh, let's see what I got here. Oh, sorry, I, I, I'm lost. I'm, my mind's a little tracked off right now. Ugh. I'm being hit, hit, hit with these last minute phone calls all of a sudden. It's like, what's going on here? I told you, people, I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm busy. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> Doing a show. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, I, uh, Reddit is like a uh, what I do on uh, Facebook. Oh, not Facebook. On Instagram. Wow, I'm a dumbass. And totally not my game today. Wow. <laughs> anyway, Reddit is like uh, Instagram. Blah, blah, blah. Fuck all that. So, back to the show. All right, let's uh, review last episode. All right, uh... We talked about, uh, actually, DL and I uh, talked about uh, Blitz, uh, about the uh, German tactic of Blitzkrieg, and they launched it through the Low Countries. And how they did it was they kind of did it in a uh, somewhat of a three prong attack, uh, one towards the um, the Maginot Line, other through the Low Countries, which the Allies thought that was the main thrust. But the main thrust was through the Ardennes, and of course. Uh, it was, of course, uh, the use of uh, highly, uh, highly powerful drugs called uh, pervitin, not pertrovin. God, I'm such a dumbass. I can't say sh- shit right. <laughs> pervitin. The pronunciation of that word is pervitin. Uh, in other words, uh, crystal meth and pill form. And they use that uh, to give them, like, you know, uh, Dutch courage, let's just say, and just attacking them nonstop, day and night, day and night. That's how they capture Sedan. In three days. And once you capture Sedan. That is just the gateway. Through northern France. And 
the Germans just ran right through it with their new uh, Blitzkrieg tactics and to, and their new fast uh, tanks where they're using the Panzer 1s and the Panzer 2s. Uh, of course, we went through the, t- the timelines for Operation Dynamo, um, the, uh, the Dunkirk evacuation. And of course, I uh, talked about Claude Nicholson uh, when I uh, was describing with my, uh, my Instagram. You know what? Go to that video and give it a like on your way in. Now, of course, the uh, the controversial uh, Holt order that Hitler issued to his troops. Uh, what he did was when he was about uh, when he had the Allies at the ropes, they or he decided to uh, told uh, Guderian and Rommel to stop the attack, withdraw back. And at first, they were confused. They were all like, "What? What the fuck? Like we have him at the ropes." No, but there, there was like many, uh, many reasons that they think why they did it. Uh, first reason leading to believe that um, Hitler wanted to negotiate with Churchill, saying, "Hey, Churchill, I'm doing this good deed for you. Now, please surrender and submit. I'm not attacking your troops. I'm sparing them. Surrender." And Churchill is pretty much like <laughs> you. <laughs> and it's just kept, kept like holding out while evacuating troops into tens of thousands. And that controversial halt order given gave enough time to for the Allies to dig in as there is somewhat of a last stand for the evacuation. And thus uh the end of Dunkirk began the Battle of Britain, which we're about to talk to later on. And I uh I went over uh Churchill's speeches uh, Dio and I played it, or I played it. <laughs> no, but anyway, uh, that's it, and let's get on to the show, baby. All right, all right. After the fall of France and before the Battle of Britain. Okay, there was this little operation, a little another controversial operation called Operation Catapult. Uh, after France's defeat on the 22nd of June, 1940, the Germans swore, <laughs> they swore not to use captured French ships. Of course, Churchill did not believe him. Like, at this point, w- w- would you believe that? Hell no. And so, therefore, Ch- Churchill dispatches an aid naval task force, known as Task Force H, uh, under the command of Admiral James Somerville. Uh, the task force as follows: You have the uh, the uh, did I list? okay. I did not list the aircraft carrier. Okay, the Brits have the aircraft carrier called the HMS Ark Royal, and you have the battle battle cruiser HMS Hood, and you have the battleships HMS Valiant and Resolution, and other minor crafts that came out of the uh, Gibraltar port. All right, Somerville. Did his best here to negotiate uh, with the Admiral, uh, the French Admiral Marcel Bruno Gensel, to join the British back to England to fight against the Nazis. But the um, negotiations uh, kind of turned sour and uh, somewhat verbally hostile. Uh, what I was reading is, Oh, like between like the uh, the admiral and one of the captains of the uh, the Ark Royal, because they kind of send uh, their own messengers instead of themselves personally, and uh, which the French admiral thought was a insult, apparently. And so, therefore, um, Somerville really, really didn't like the idea of firing on his own allied ships because the French were on our side ever since World War I. Like, the idea of firing on friendlies is disturbing. In fact, he resigned. Uh, resigned from his own command. But therefore, uh, Churchill assigns Admiral Andrew Cunningham to, to Task Force H. All right, even though the ultimatum has been delivered, the anchored French forces did not expect a barrage from the British ships. Oh, they did. They weren't taking any chances of getting those ships. 
into Nazi hands. Yeah, you got that right. Fired on the French ships while they were still anchored at port. French ships, the Dunkirk, the Strasbourg, the Bretonnage, the Mogador, the Lennox, and the Crescent were either severely damaged or sunk. Uh, the Third Reich under the, uh, oh, this, get this, guys, uh, another uh, key player of the uh, the Nazis, uh, Joseph Goebbels, uh, the Nazi uh, Ministry of Propaganda. Uh, this guy was in charge of the whole uh, fanatic uh, propaganda. Uh, reasons how, like, you know, like, the yeah, hell Hitler and all that bullshit. But anyway, uh, he was good at his job. In fact, he kind of used this as an advantage of saying, hey, the British are the bad guys. So he used this as his own uh, own anti-British propaganda. However, like, you can understand this, like, the Brits could not afford to have those ships fall into Axis hands. In fact, Churchill himself was, he was disturbed himself, like, giving this order himself. Like, he did not take this, he, he did not give this order lightly. In fact, some say that it started his uh, drinking problem because of making decisions like that. Because if he would have played nice guy, he would have played, like, you know, a Chamberlain. Uh, chances are those ships would have been used as the Nazis' launch pad towards their their amphibious, amphibious invasion of southern England, which we will talk about on the next slide. But also, it actually sends out a message to the world, uh, pretty much saying Britain is determined to, for, to this war. They will fight the Nazis. Alone, if necessary. Like, Churchill was having none of that. I'm telling you. Guys, like the video on your way in. So it's giving this hot content right now, which I'm about to show you right now. Ho, 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 baby. Hang on, let me get some water here. One thing that sucks about you know, recovering from, or not recovering, you know, surviving cancer, or no, survived cancer correction, and the after shit you receive after. Yeah, um, I really don't have a uh, saliva gland on my, on the left side of my face, so I only have one saliva gland instead of the two that human beings have, though, but therefore I get pasty a lot easier. All right. Anyway, uh, Operation Sea Lion. This is uh, Hitler's plan itself to invade southern England. Uh, in order for Sea Lion itself to be successful, Germany really had to have air dominance over the channel. By air dominance, like they they really need to ensure this this invasion is one hundred one hundred percent successful. Uh, so the idea of it is uh, Germany Army Group C under the same command of von Lieb would launch from Cherbourg to Lehm's Reus. While Germany, Germany Army Group A under the same command of our old buddy uh, Gerald von Wundstedt would launch from Le Havre, Boulogne, Calais, Dunkirk, and Ostend and right into Portsmouth, Brighton, Bexhill, Dover, and Ramsgate. And then German paratroopers, as you see on the map over there, would drop over Brighton and over. Oh, excuse me. All right, so you see here that, it, like, stuff is really, really getting serious here. Uh, even, like, Churchill said himself, like, the Battle of France is over. The Battle of, Fran Battle of Britain is about to begin. And then it's the, uh, you know, we shall never surrender speech. Yeah. We shall fight in the hills. We shall fight in the lands. We shall never surrender. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. That's for Churchill. All right. Of course, uh, 
this map right in front of you. This is like pretty much like the all-out attack on the on England itself. And of course, you have some areas that was it: uh, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales. Oh, yeah. Okay, the Battle of Britain. <laughs> Uh, both the RAF and the Luftwaffe were badly damaged during the uh, the Dunkirk campaign uh, and the Battle of France. Uh, the the, uh, the loss as follows. Got the numbers right here. Uh, the RAF, they lost uh, 940, 940 planes. That includes 386 hurricanes and 67 Spitfires. Uh, the Hawk Hurricane was uh, ma mass produced. It was like, was like the main British fighter uh, until a lot of the supermarine spitfire came out and it was well we will talk about those planes later on and, and the slides i think i like them now, anyway however the uh the luftwaffe laws 1100 aircrafts including 200 mr smith me 109s and 500 heinkel he 111 bombers Okay, so you see on uh, the map over here. Actually, do I have that? Okay, anyway, uh, on 10th of July, uh, Luftwaffe's first major attack bombs uh, bombs the uh, Swanisa docks and Ordnance Factory at Pembury. So on July 10th, that's when uh, like, pretty much, like the main battle of Britain kicked off. Whew. Of course, like you will see, like uh, like like that they have uh, they have uh, Dornier bombers, Heinkels, like the whole yard, the whole yard, and you have uh, what which we call it um, Stukas as well. And these like the Luftwaffe, they they were ready. Um, uh, once again, um, actually, you know what? Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's see. Let's review why the Nazis decided to decide to bombard the hell out of Britain. All right, let's see why. Because I should have, like, I apologize, folks. I should have mentioned this right before when I show you the uh, the Operation Sea Line uh, tactics. Um, okay, Lu like Goering's idea of um of making seed line successful is to either destroy, like he wants to destroy the RAF. Like that, that, that's his plan. Destroy the RAF or put it out of commission. How we bomb it. We bomb the living <laughs> out of it. Yeah. That was his plan. I know. That's pretty <laughs> up, right? Like, like th th there's no coordination with the other uh, armed forces, like the army and the Navy. Or anything like that. It's like you know, we're just gonna we're, we're just gonna bomb the RAF. Like that, that, that was this whole major. That's the plan. That's his backup. That's his backup plan. That's his main plan. That's his plan A, B, C, all the way to Z. Now, however, when he when he does like, because he thinks like, okay, we're, we're just gonna like he's, both Hitler and Gore and Gibbles and Himmler and all those cats. Really were convinced that Britain was finished. They were convinced that the RAF are down to their last, I don't know, 200 air, somewhat aircraft. And the Luftwaffe has like an abundance, like of thousands. Uh, well, actually, near thousands. And it's like, you know what? We bomb them once, we're good. But ho ho ho. When, they, uh, when they're on their way to uh, Swanisa, when on the Swanisa docks, uh, the RAF were actually waiting for them. There were squadrons of um, of RAFs, Hurricanes, and Spitfires waiting for those guys, shooting them down like <laughs> right out of the skies. Oh, but the but the Luftwaffe pilots learned a valuable lesson in this. They knew the the Brits saw them coming a mile away, even just right when they're taking off from France. They picked them up. They know they were coming, and they learned about it. In fact, they try to uh, address it to uh, 
German uh, Luftwaffe intelligence. And guess what? They didn't want to hear it. They did not want to hear it. They're like, we don't care. We'll give you more planes, train more pilots, keep bombing. Uh, and who was this guy? All right, I'm just going to get with this map over here. All right. Who was this guy that is uh, feeding growing uh, his intelligence? All right. It is by the guy named Joseph Schmidt or Beppo, as he was called. Uh, he was basically uh, commander in chief of uh, the Luftwaffe's uh, military intelligence branch. Uh, he, he really completely ignored uh, the uh, the English defense system. And that was pretty much like uh, this defense system was really, really crucial to defending Great Britain from the air. Uh, in fact, he was the guy that convinced Gruing himself that, hey, we can win. We can win this with the amount of planes that we have, with the amount of skilled pilots we have. Oh, yeah, we got Britain. And we, 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 we got him. We got him, Herman. We got him. Pat him back. We got this. Oh, yeah, he was feeding him all this bullshit. <laughs> uh, and he also convinced him that the Mission Smiths were far superior than uh, than the British planes, which, yes and no, until they introduced the Spitfire, which uh, the Spitfire and the Mission Smith were kind of what kind of playing in even terms. And also, that's like the first time that the Luftwaffe, uh, the Luftwaffe's first experience engaging the Spitfire. All right, during uh, Dunkirk and the Battle of France, uh, they were mostly engaging uh, the Hawker Hurricanes and a bit of the Spitfires, though. But uh, the Spitfires at the time were in, weren't in abundant number until uh later in the battle britain where they saw these things for the first time and the, and the mass of i don't know tens of fifties of hundreds uh i shouldn't i, I said that's a big exaggeration <laughs> but you know what i mean like there are a lot of them there are a lot more spitfires than the lou fuffle could handle and they're like what what the fuck <laughs> and these spitfires man oh like they can definitely either like definitely outmaneuver the Mr. Smith. And and Lou Pop and Pilots were like, what the hell, man? So but nope. Beppo Schmidt really didn't want to hear that. And also convinced uh Goering that hey, we can produce quicker than they can, which it is the totally <laughs> opposite. I'm telling you that right now. All right, he was just basically telling Green what he wanted to hear. In fact, uh, he had no... How do you say this? Uh... I say this. Um, he really didn't have any intel. You would think like a guy who's in the intelligence service would have guys on the inside, like inside England, giving him information, right? No, he really didn't have that. He, he was just guessing. Uh, what do you call it? The most flimsiest of intelligence. Like, oh my god, this guy really didn't know how to do his job. In fact, he he went down as the worst intelligence officer the Reich has ever produced. I think he was like, I think it was like Hen Henry Kimmler. I think he just wanted to look good in uniform. <laughs> just didn't want to do his job. Or just trying to make it easy. No, but that you know, that, that easy way that he tried to do, yeah, that cost a lot of lives. However, he doesn't know that once you bomb uh, British airfields, they're, they're pretty much repaired in 24 hours, guys. Uh, you, you have uh, British servicemen and service women just putting it back together. Oh, bomb crate, fill it up back together. Uh, planes damage, we'll fix them. Why well, it was nothing for the Brits. Oh, and this is interesting. All right, 19th of July, 1940. Uh, Adolf Hitler addresses the United Kingdom in the Reichstag to uh, start negotiations or suffer the consequences. Basically, uh, telling, uh, basically Hitler was telling Churchill, it's like, hey, 
we'll, we'll forgive and forget. Like you have, even though you have no right interfering or in, interfere with our business in Poland, uh, I had nothing to do with you. If you just just surrender, everything will be forgiven. In fact, I'll be super nice and immune you from invasion. You get to keep your land. You get to keep your colonies. You get to keep your military. Just stay out of our way so we can take care of the East. And Churchill was like, you. We should never surrender. <laughs> I, I should get a soundbite of that. Guys, give me a like if you really want to hear a soundbite of Churchill going, we should never surrender. <laughs> All right. All right. Reason why I'm showing this map again because uh, Eagle Day happens. If you never heard of Eagle Day, that is uh, a German operation to start bombing uh, British airfields. All right. So Goring launches one of the biggest operations in the war. So, therefore, he destroys the RAF airfields to the point where they have to retreat inland. That's another reason why they want uh, Operation Sea Line to be successful. Because the whole point of, in theory, of the, of the Luftwaffe's tactics, of they want to bomb these airfields, uh, they just want to bomb them into submission to the point where they have to be forced to go inland. Once they go inland, they lose the range. And they have no uh, range over the channel, which thus allowed a German successful invasion over the channel. All right. However, he, the reports that there were reports of bad weather happened during that day. Uh, he did, uh, Goring did try to uh, call it off. Almost at the last minute though, but he, he did call it off. Uh, some squadrons got the call and went back. Some got it too late. And other squadrons just never got got it at all. And it was a catastrophic failure for the Luftwaffe in the front. It wasn't casual. They lost pretty badly. In fact, poor communication lines only got through a few squadrons. Some got it, some didn't. Yeah. Oh, but they learned a valuable lesson. Once again, Schmidt didn't want to hear it. Oh, what's this right here? Okay, this is the this is the like this is the one thing that right here that Schmidt is ignoring the doubting system. All right, here we go. Uh, named after Hugh Doubting, the get the man, that handsome looking man on the right. Uh, he's the commander in chief of uh, Fighter Command. I, he personally oversaw this development of the air defense system uh, within uh, over. Okay. Yeah, let's see if I have this on the next slide here. Nope. Okay, so he has over 21, 300, 360 foot radar mass on the southern and eastern coast of the British Isles. So he almost have the Isles completely surrounded with radar. Uh, and it can detect up aircraft up to 193 kilometers, uh, 120 miles for you guys. Uh, if the aircraft is flying below them, you have 30 other smaller mass known as chain home below. Uh, we'll detect them. Uh, you have a uh, chain home, which is the uh, the taller radars, and chain home low, which is the lower radars. Uh, Okay. All right. So when uh, Luftwaffe aircraft uh, will be spotted by. Okay. Let, let me start that again. Okay. When uh, when when you see the aircraft flying over the coast, uh, it would also be spotted by uh, observers of the British Observer Corps. Uh, we're talking about over thirty thousand volunteers. Uh, they will be posted to the coast day and night. Uh, tracking, reporting enemy raids. Uh, radar, like r radar, can do you can give you so much. Uh, it can give you um, 
it can give you the aircraft where it's located, but it, it, it can't give you, it, it can't tell you uh, exactly how many, what kind of formation, and how fast they're going, and what kind of bombs they're carrying. This is where the Observer Corps comes into play. All right, so therefore, like they, the Observer Corps can report details in their interlocking posts all around the British coast and inlands. And then all they pretty much have is a pair of, binocul uh, pair of binoculars and a pentagraph, which looks like a, what you call a giant sexton. If you know what a sexton is, it's what, uh, what's, what sailors would use to uh, navigate the seas. Kind of using the stars and what I, I think that's how it works. Uh, drop when guys drop in the comments if uh, if you know what I'm talking about because I, I don't even know I'm not a sailor though. But <laughs> all I know is it, it, it really it really helped the observer corps do their job, and this is the tool that helps them to uh, give like bearings and distance from the aircraft. Uh, of course, these raid reports. From the observer corps, then will be transferred over at fighter command headquarters in 40 seconds. As you see at this map over here, uh, you have this uh system of information flowing. All right, so you have uh from observer corps and then from radar to uh the, the flight command headquarters at Be but my eyes can't see today <laughs> at Bentley Park. There we go. All right, these raid reports, uh, they can actually arrive at flight, at flight command in 40 seconds. Okay. The Observer Corps would report his command, or not report his command, report hit, what, what he sees, and then reports it to uh, headquarters, and all, this and all this process can be done in 40 seconds. Again, uh, you're probably thinking, why so slow? Well, they really didn't have cell phones back then, guys. Of course, they, they couldn't... Go uh, come from a text. You're like, click, click. Hey guys, Germans are coming. Click, click, send. No, no, it wasn't like that. It was binoculars, notepad, right distance. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey guys, go on the radio, and then that message will be transferred to uh, Bentley Park. Man, actually, I'm just gonna read you from my notes right here. All right, then these reports will go through the filter room and control room at Bentley Park, uh, Flight Command Headquarters. Okay, so you have the filter room, uh, information coming from the radar only, and you have the control room, uh, information coming from the radar and the observer core. Uh, that information again, then gets passed down to group headquarters operations room, who will determine to deploy uh, barrage balloons or anti-aircraft batteries. Uh, then if it, they need something more, then the information passes down to, to sector station operations. Uh, pressure. Uh, sector station operations room and which they will deploy uh, air squadrons and searchlights. Okay, the uh, the sector station. This one's kind of interesting right here. You probably see videos of uh, of let's say uh, like a big table, a, a big table of the map. Uh, there you have the English Channel, you have Great Britain, and you have France, which is occupied by the Nazis. And you see uh, like service women as uh, doing like playing like shuffleboard on this map like they're playing a big like they're playing like a big game of risk yeah these women they played a crucial role in the battle of britain like they were uh they, they were feeding this command down to like down to the squad it was down to bentley headquarters and therefore, that was making this whole, uh, what do you call it, uh, the doubting system successful. All right, let's not, let's not talk more of that. Let's move on to uh, the, the Knickelbein system. All right, so daylight is not working out for the Germans, so they switch tactics to night attacks. All right, the uh, Knickelbein system. Uh, Knickelbein, crooked leg is a radio communication system that allowed bomber pilots to navigate in the dark. Uh, Germans were planned to use the connected by system at night. Uh, it consists of uh, dots and dashes. 
Uh, the pilot flies the center path between two beams of dots and dashes so the pilot would know that this is the course to follow without resorting to any maps. Uh, the doubting system relied on daylight, so this is another challenge that uh, Churchill had to face. All right. So you have Gurren switching tactics because he's getting piss poor information by a guy who doesn't know what the f he's doing. And each and every time when uh, uh, Gurren's failing, he's slamming the table like. Nine, 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 nine. <laughs> Oh, but yeah. All right. And all you've been waiting for. The Spitfire. Actually, the aircraft. The aircraft that I really wanted you to show. Or right, even before the Battle of Britain was over, the RAF, the Luftwaffe, the United States Army Air Force, or the Navy, the the the. the the Imperial Japanese Army Air Service, whatever. Like, these competing powers and their air forces were developing newer versions of their aircraft. Like, for example, you have the Spitfire 1 and the uh, Mr. Schmidt ME-109E were matched, and these guys played a role in the Battle of Britain. Uh, when uh, the ME-109F was introduced, it was superior to even the Spitfire Mark V. Oh, excuse me. However, uh, when uh, the, when uh, the Brits were developing uh, more and more aircraft to the Spitfire Mark IX and the Mark XIV, they end up outpacing the even ME-109G, which is the, the Germans' up-to-date Messerschmitt. And all right, in fact, I'll give you the uh, the specifications on these beautiful puppies according to uh, Jim Winchester's uh, aircraft encyclopedia. All right, so the, you have the Spitfire, which is uh, made from the United Kingdom. Uh, Single-seat fighter. It has uh, 10,030 horsepower. Ro Rolls-Royce, not uh, <laughs> Rolls-Royce, uh, Merlin 3 liquid-cooled uh, liquid cooled V12 engines. Oh. And guys, like on, if you're going to an air show and you actually hear these engines go off, oh, it is beautiful. If you're a Harley lover, you'll love the Spitfire going out. And if you're a muscle car lover, he'll definitely love this engine going off. Oh, the Rolls Royce Merlin. Whoo, baby. Glad to have that in your vehicle. <laughs> uh, it, it can go up to uh, 582 kilometers an hour. Uh, range is on the fuel tank is 636 kilometers. Uh, the service ceiling is up to uh, uh, 31,900 feet. And I can give it specifications, though, but eh, uh, it's not important. Now, I should give it the uh, quick introduction here. Uh, the Supermarine Spitfire is the icon of the World Air Force Fighter Command and the Battle of Britain, which officially lasted from July to November 1940. Uh, 19 squadrons flew Spitfires during this time, most likely Mark 1As with eight machine guns, but also a small regular of Mark 1 Bravos with a pair of 20 millimeter uh, cannons. Uh, in August and sep sep uh, September 1940, uh, the, RA uh, the RAF lost 147 Spitfires, but production of replacements was just able to keep the pace with the rate of attrition or attrition. Uh, which means that even though they are losing Spitfires, they, they, they can still keep up production. Which is another thing that our friend Schmidt did not see. Or didn't bother to look. God, what a... Dumbass! <laughs> you would think a, a person who is in charge of intelligence would have people on the inside. No, he doesn't have that. Alright, and here we go with the, the uh, competitors here. Uh... The German bombers. The Germans. Ooh, dirty, dirty Germans. <laughs> now, in 1940, the uh, Luftwaffe was able to find, uh, able to field 4,000 aircrafts Ooh, against Britain from bases in France, Belgium, 
the, the Netherlands and Norway. From October, Italy committed to to uh, uh, well, to commit their uh, their part in in the campaign, but to little effect. Uh, these bombings by striking airfield and radar stations, the Luftwaffe came close to neutralizing the defenses. But a uh, switch to raids on London gave the RAF breathing space to replace its losses and refine its tactics. The Luftwaffe failed to achieve air security and called off the invasion plans. Oh, spoiler alert. We'll get back to that later. Again, I'm just reading it off. Uh, Jim Winchester's here. I give the uh, the specifications of the uh, Dornier. Uh, well, I'm not going to go into that though. But oh, let's give you that. the Dornier is a four man bomber. Uh, maximum speed is 425 kilometers. Uh, range uh 1,160 kilometers. Uh, yeah. Uh, bomb. You have the uh, the Mission Smith BF 110C, uh, which is a uh, twin engine fighter. Uh, you have a pilot and the guy at the back uh, covering the six. That's the whole idea. Uh, so the BF-110 was a heavy zerosta, or destroyer fighter, used as a high-speed light bomber. BF-110s made some notable position raids on targets in England's south coast, but as an escort fighter, it proved vulnerable to RAF single-engine fighters like the Spitfire and the Hurricane. And then you have the Heinkel 3s H-2, uh, it's a five crew medium bomber, and you have the Heinkel H H3, uh, yeah, three H3, and you have the Junkers Ju 88A1. Uh, this is another uh, a medium bomber. Uh, it's, it's a like these guys right here. They were in charge of the night blitz. Uh, these guys were hooked with the uh, Kinecobine system. Oh, excuse me. Sorry about that. My Thing fell on me. <laughs> All right. All right. These guys here, the Hawker Hurricanes. All right. Even though the uh, the Hawker replacement was technically supposed to be replaced by the Spitfire, the what during the Battle of Britain. No, we're gonna send everything we have. So the hurricane, uh, the hurricane was less technologically sophisticated than the Spitfire, slower and less maneuverable. But it was more stable gun platform and more resistant to battle damage. Even though it couldn't move, though, but it can take some hits. Most importantly, it was numerous. Like, they have an abundance of them with, uh, with uh, 1,715 in service between July and November 1940. Uh, in fact, I, these things were around even more, around longer than the, Spit, than the Spitfire. And they have uh, they have a record of destroying more Luftwaffe aircraft than any other defenses combined, including fighters, anti-aircraft guns, and barrage balloons. Uh, the fuselages were fabric fabric covering over metal tube and wooden structure. All right, so uh, the Hurricane is another uh, single seat fighter uh, with uh, ten thirty horsepower. Uh, uh, Rolls Royce Merlin two liquid. Uh, liquid uh, liquid cooled V12 engines. Uh, maximum speed is 496 kilometers. Uh, range up to 845 kilometers, and it weighs up to uh, uh, 6,218 pounds. Loaded, loaded like rock and roll, baby. And these uh, aircrafts were flown mostly with the 303 Squadron. If you don't know what the 303 Squadron is, it is a highly decorated uh, Polish squadron fighting under RAF command. And let's see the competitors, baby. The Mission Smiths, the BF 109s. All right, the BF 109E was comparable to the Spitfire Mark 1 in speed and maneuverability. Its fuel injected Dalmier Benz engine had the advantage of not cutting out when sub, uh, subjugated to negative G-forces, unlike the Merlin, and its 20mm cannons packed a secret powerful punch. Uh, operating over South East England, however, the, the Emily was at extremes of its range. It could spend only about 20 minutes in combat. The radios fitted Luftwaffe, fighter, uh, 
the radios fitted uh, to Luftwaffe fight- fighters were not compatible with those in bombers. So in other words, they, they had a hard time communicating with each other. Like like you would think, like they need they need to be a cooperation, like a strict communication lines between fighters and bombers. No, but then again, the Allies kind of had that same problem too. Not gonna judge, though, but different technology, different times. I don't know I could give specifications for that. All right, the uh Again, another single seat fighter, uh, 1200 horsepower, uh, Dolbear Benz DB6601 six, uh, and inverted V12 pins, piston engines. So, another V12. Ho, ho. This thing probably sounds like a beast. Actually, in fact, I only heard like what's uh, on the net. It even sounded like a beast. But I heard the Spitfire in real life, and ho, ho, ho. Hearing it with your own two ears, guy. Oh, man. That thing is a beast. All right, but fuck all that. Back to the show. <laughs> all right, these are other miscellaneous aircrafts that were involved in the Battle of Britain. You have uh, uh, British fighters, fighter destroyers, uh, bombers uh, that end up bombing Berlin, and so on and so forth. All right. Hang on, let's see here. Oh, okay, I'm going to go over the uh, the Battle of Britain timeline. I'm going to do it in uh, four phases here. All right, so, excuse me. <clears throat> All right, so it doesn't feel okay. Phase one. Round one, fight. Uh, from the 10th of, uh, 10th of July to the 12th of August, uh, attacks on Tannoy shipping. Not happening. Uh, Luftwaffe attacks shipping convoys in the English Channel. Uh, Channel Force and Coast Radar Stations attacked and also I'm raised for nothing. All right, well, on the 16th of July, Hitler calls preparations for sea line. All right, so Hitler demands that the RAF be eliminated or out of commission for the invasion troops. Okay, just like we talked about before. Uh, for the idea of a sea line to happen, they really need to drive the RAF more inward so they don't have priority over channel. All right. Here we do. Round two. Fight. 13th to 18th of August. Attack on aircraft air. Attack on airfield and radar stations. So we call the air force to be in the He needs some milk. Oh, that doesn't happen yet. Okay, 13th of August. This is when Eagle Day happened. Uh, Luftwaffe launches intense air raids on RAF airfields and southern England. We talked about uh, in detail on Eagle Day, which really didn't, didn't work out for Luftwaffe. Uh, last minute call offs kind of screwed me even more. Of course, uh, it this kind of turns the tide for Luftwaffe. On 18th of August, August, 
the first thing we call this the hardest day. Uh, fierce air battles between the Luftwaffe and the RAF's uh, severe loss of RAF on the ground as well. Uh, let's see here. All right, anyway, round round okay. three. Fight. Phase three, guys. This is when they start to uh, bomb towns, cities, and airfields across England. So it's not just airfields, like like. Hitler really wanted to bomb the UK into submission. It's either Churchill, I can stop this right now, just surrender. And Churchill and the rest of the Brits were like, off. You surrender. <laughs> All right, so 19th of August through the 6th of September. Uh, that's when they happened. Uh, 20th of August. Uh, Churchill actually does this whole uh, morale boost. Uh, so he, he acknowledges an enormous gratitude to the British people uh, and also to the servicemen and to the service women uh, across the British Isles. Never in the field of human conflict have so much better owed by so many few. Like Even like that's what Churchill was saying to the public. Uh, he was telling them that uh, Hey, you're gonna do a good job. I have faith in you. And then after, after you know, a couple of days of being bombed, the living <laughs> Churchill comes back again and be like, "You've done a good job. You've done a great service. Keep at it, and we're gonna win this." Like you're working hard, and it shows. And and that's like a huge like morale boost for the British people because Churchill went from uh, addressing people, "Hey, you're gonna do something great." To you already have done something great, and after like when uh, towns and bomb uh, towns and cities were bombed, they're just pretty much you know pick up the pieces together. Like even pubs were like swooping up. Um, yep, pint's still working. Cheerio, cheers, clink. Oh yeah, still having a pint like nothing happened. It, they don't even have signs saying no roof, still in service. Two pints for one. Two pints for one uh, special. Oh yeah, they keep going on like nothing happened. Well, they clean up the mess simultaneously. So uh, yeah, like the uh, the British, like they they at the time they were, I say, uh, I don't know, uh, steel nerved nerves of steel. Like I'm telling you, like during this time, like unlike. Unlike the people today, like the civilians back then, oh, they they had courageous. They didn't like being bombed, no, but they knew how to handle themselves. I I give my hats to the British for that. In fact, they they Great Britain gets the Don DeMarco for that. Don DeMarco. <laughs> anyway, back to what I was saying. Uh, twenty fourth of August. Uh, during night bombings, this is when things get intensified. A lost formation of Heinkel bombers mistake the East re residential area of London as a military target. Uh, I'm I listed uh, munitions storage. It's actually it was actually a oil refinery area that they were trying to bomb, but they kind of end up uh, mistakenly bomb a uh, residential area, which I, I kind of do believe because you know like it's war, it's night bombing. The chemical bomb system isn't exactly 100% accurate. Maybe somebody fiddled around with it. Maybe it's maybe it a conspiracy. <laughs> I don't know, though, but all I do know is that I kind of pissed off the, uh, not just Churchill, but Hitler as well. And you're like, Hitler? What? What the fuck? Oh, yeah. Like, because he wanted the decision of bombing Britain to be his and his alone. But what the mistakes of the Luf of the Heinkel pilots? Kind of took that away from him. Because now, on the 20th, 25th of August, uh, Fighter Command, uh, sorry, RAF launches uh, bombing campaigns in Berlin. Therefore, this is the creation of Bomber Command. 
uh, 31st of August, uh, Fighter Command uh, suffers heaviest losses to date. And this is when uh, the, our famous uh, Polish uh, 303 Squadron becomes operational, based in Northolt. And these guys, uh, these guys bagged a lot of kills. Uh, these guys, this is where most of the aces took in place, right here. Uh, the 303 was consist of uh, Poles and Czechs. And one of the squadron leaders, it happens to be a fellow Canadian, uh, by the name of uh, John Allen Kent. Uh, of course, uh, he was called uh, Kentowski to his Polish comrades. <laughs> and this Canadian fighter was also had a few uh, few kills. In fact, he was also an ace himself. Uh, it's a little uh, little goes to a uh, little Canadian okay thing for you. <laughs> All right, phase four and final phase, or I think it was phase four, or phase five. Though we'll, we'll think, we'll, we'll think, say it's phase round five. four. Fight. All right, seventh of September to the thirty-first of October, nineteen forty. Uh, mass bombing raids were launched against London and continued against other cities. And so this is like the the, the pounding saw the England pounding and pounding, pounding to the point where. Where eleven group literally had to force to back their airfields and land. So uh Himmler's uh changing tactics uh diversely, uh because like he's constantly like constantly like you know changing tactics left left, right, and center, saying, you know, you need to do more escorts for the for the bombers, so that's more work for the fighters. And yeah, so this this bombing pressure is actually paying off. So, but Germans didn't know because once again, Schmidt doesn't know because Schmidt's keep telling him, you know what? Keep bombing Britain around the clock. Keep bombing the cities around the clock. So, but that caused like the airfields to actually recuperate and fight off the Luftwaffe. Because you had the 15th of September this is uh, what you call uh, Guru Ring's last roll of the dice, which known as the Battle of Britain Day. Uh, the Luftwaffe launches its biggest bombing campaigns on London, like like the uh, the aircraft the aircraft I was showing you before. Uh, they they were all participated, I should say, uh, most of them, like ninety percent of them, and. This is when uh, Goring like, was trying to pound city after city after city. What you should have done is continue to bombing the airfields because that was working. Though, but he, for last minute reasons, he wanted to bomb the cities night and day, which again allowed the airfields to recuperate. So, thanks a lot, Schmidt, you dumbass. You just cost a loop off of viable aircraft and men. <coughs> Oh, excuse me. All right, so Fighter Command successfully fights off the attacking forces uh, to the point where the Luftwaffe sustains catastrophic losses to the point that could never be recovered. And the 17th, on the 17th of September, Hitler postpones, postpones Operation Sea Lion. Of course, there were continued uh, bombing campaigns through 1941. Oh, but the good news is Britain hold off. In fact, their sacrifices paid the way for Allied victory. So. Oh. Here. All right. Anyway, that's all I have for you for the Battle of Britain. So, thank you for tuning in, guys. For uh, yeah, guys, thank you for tuning in. So, make sure you like the video on your way in, so I can level up the algorithm. And yeah, before I log off, I just wanted to say that ho ho ho.
imagine uh, uh, delivering the news to either Goering or Hitler that you couldn't successfully destroy the RAF from going what what the fuck to how dare you and then nine, 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 nine. <laughs> and then there is uh, Churchill Sir Hugh Sir Hugh Dowling going gotcha bitch <laughs> All right, thanks for tuning in, guys. Uh, next episode, uh, I might do uh, Battle of the Atlantic, or I just might skip to uh, Pearl Harbor. I don't know. I really, I don't know what to do, guys. Actually, I do know what to do. Um, I will do Battle of the Atlantic. That's what I'm gonna do. So tune in. Uh, thank you very much. Don't forget to like the video way in. And thanks for tuning in, guys. Hang on, let's see here. All right. Good night.